Now I know what you're all thinking. You woke up this morning, you thought you were in San Diego, you went outside, and the sky was gray and overcast. It was below 72. <laughs> and you thought the only reasonable explanation is that you'd woken up in a parallel universe. <laughs> but fear not, there is still cosplay, Comic-Con, and She-Hulk Attorney at Law is still going to premiere, so all is more or less right with the world. I'm Steve Snyder, I'm the President and CEO of the Fleet Science Center, uh, and I'm excited to see you all here on a panel about science, because we love science at the Fleet Science Center, go figure. The Fleet is a countywide organization, and we work with communities all across San Diego to leverage STEM and STEM learning to advance their goals and aspirations. And one of the ways we do that is, and I have to do this because although our marketing person isn't here in the room, it is a requirement that she does to allow me back into the building on Monday. Uh, the Fleet Science Center also operates the Fleet Science Center in Balboa Park, San Diego's fabulous hands-on science center. We're also the home of the world's first domed IMAX theater. And up until a few months ago, we were running the oldest functioning IMAX projector in the world, IMAX projector number two, that has finally been retired. Um, but fear not, we did replace it with a laser digital projection system, and that projection system is 007. So, very cool. But today, we are excited to be talking about 20 years of Spider-Man and the multiverse, particularly from a science point of view. We have a great panel of folks here. Um, I have to admit, my, uh, my first encounter with Spider-Man was more than 20 years ago, um, and was related to a song which we all know, and if we could, mm, all together, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Oh, thank you. So, so <laughs> Although I will admit, in fourth grade, someone decided it would be a good way to taunt me, because you might notice my name is slightly sounds like it, and so I'd be greeted every morning by Spider, Snyder Man, Snyder Man, does whatever a Snyder can. Um, I don't know why that was supposed to be some kind of taunt, but I'll leave that to you. Uh, anyway, we have a great panel for you, for you today, so let me introduce everyone who is here, uh, and then we'll get going. Um, to my left, right here, is Kokila Shankar. She is a PhD student in Dr. Oliver George's lab at UCSD. Awesome fan base. She researches nicotine addiction, and in her work, uh, she uh, uses a wide variety of scientific tubes to understand how drugs can alter our brains, bodies, and behavior. All right, welcome. <laughs> Next up, directly to her left, is Victor, uh, Victor uh, Guineros, uh, and he wrote his own. So, this is a pitch, John. Uh -oh. For a future writer, uh -oh. you can see. With great power comes great responsibility. It's not just a line from his favorite Spider-Man comic book. It was the opening line from his genetics lab professor. Transforming from a lab rat into a biotechnologist, bioinformatician, and dark immunologist. Uh-oh. Is your favorite neighborhood scientific researcher, Victor. So welcome, Victor. Next, we have Jorge Uresti. Jorge is uh, currently principal scientist at Vivent Bio and has been working in the fields of genetics, disease modeling, and stem cells for over a decade. He's a big time fan of Spider Man since the animated TV show back in the 90s. Oh, gosh. Uh, when Jorge is not at the lab or reading comics, you may find him practicing freestyling rap or writing lyrics for his music persona. <laughs> not in a power of universe, in this one itself. Next up, Erica Hamden is a professor of astrophysics at the University of Arizona. She specializes in building telescopes that go into space. <laughs> oh, space telescopes. That's a novel idea. That's awesome. I would, a pretty exciting week, I imagine, for you. Uh, in space and stratosphere and developing technology to make telescopes better. Uh, she's also a former chef, TED fellow, AAAS If Then ambassador, aspiring astronaut, astronaut, and currently working on her pilot's license. Oh, <laughs> Then we have Chelsea Bollinger. She writes, physicist but cool. Come on. We are all awesomely hip, right? Chelsea Bollinger holds a bachelor's of physics uh, from UCSD and an MS in mechanical engineering from SDSU. She works as a systems engineer, distinguishes herself as an excellent science communicator, translating complex technical topics into actionable insights for her program management team and client stakeholders. So welcome, Chelsea. And then last but not least, 
John Barber. John Barber is a comic book writer best known for his long run on Transformers. He's also written for Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, Punisher, Back to the Future, and Star Wars comics. He's a former editor-in-chief of IDW Publishing here in San Diego uh, and an editor at Marvel Comics. He lives here in San Diego with his wife, two kids, one of whom is here. All she's right. not. She's, she's not. She's All not. right. Aww. They blew you off. Oh, dude. Uh, and a dog who's best known for her long run as a character in the Transformer comics. So... <laughs> Let's get down to it. So I'm just going to throw this out to all of you, and we'll start with the big obvious one. Spider-Man. <laughs> all right. Bitten by a radioactive spider. How possible? How realistic? And, and I'll just maybe be a little bit more specific than just an open end in there. A spider bite. A single tiny spider bite fundamentally transforms everything about these folks. How realistic is that? Super realistic. Super realistic, I think. We'll leave this one to the geneticists on the panel. Yeah. Uh, push. On, yeah, you're, no, you're good. Hello. Yeah. Oh, so my name is Victor Guarneros. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Snyder and Andrea Decker, Emily Chung, Kristen Kearns, and uh, Ms. Hendricks as well for allowing us to be on this panel with these amazing uh, scientists and colleagues. Uh, also, please support your local uh, nonprofit organization as the Ruben Fleet, uh, the San Diego Human Society, and your local shelters. Thank you. And getting back to the, <laughs> to the question is uh, also the San Diego Jew Symphony as well. It's another nonprofit. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, please, uh, in this case, uh, it all depends. If this is one of the questions that we actually talk about how possible it is. And even Jorge brought it to attention. Look, which Spider-Man you want to be? Would you like to be Tobey Maguire Spider-Man? Or would you like to be Tom Holland Spider-Man? And based on that bite, uh, the spider needs to have enough uh, radiation in order to have that enough power in order to when you take when you have that bite and then it will actually alter your DNA there's a lot of things happening there and everything has to be synchronized and perfect in order for you to become a spider-man or a spider woman and it's just like a baby there's a lot of million things happening in order to become that so it's not that easy that's <laughs> one in several billion ways that you can become something else. There's a couple issues where Spider-Man grow different arms, have different many eyeballs, so it has to be the perfect amount and the perfect timing for that to happen. I do Thank like you. the idea to all add on. Um, with the new Spider-Man, he's like pseudo Iron Man, if you will, and the idea of the addition of gadgets and machinery rather than genetic mutations to add those superpowers, I think is I, I would say argue more feasible, but without a biology background, I can't really say which one's more feasible. <laughs> but I would like to say that like things like the, the web shooters that aren't in your arms but are attached to your arms seem a little more realistic from an engineering standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, oh, oh, All right. I would also just like to add, I mean, I think whether or not some of the physical abilities, like shooting webs out of your wrists, you know, that may be a little hard to, to happen physically, but Something like a spidey sense might be a lot more realistic. I mean, whatever's in that spider bite, various venoms, different chemicals, maybe even some of the radiation that may make, it way, make its way up to your brain. I wouldn't see why it's not possible to have a lot of like heightened firing in your brain. That could make some of your senses a lot more aware. Um, could give you some extra, extra boosts when you're trying to sense some villains nearby. So. I think there's, that's probably a little more likely than some of the other things that we've seen in the movies or read in the comics. I feel like I would like it if it, if it wasn't a radioactive spider. Because uh, I, I don't know, have any of you guys seen the Chernobyl on HBO? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, I just feel like it's not, it's not healthy in any way. It's not giving you any extra senses. It's just all bad. So maybe if it were like a, a mutant spider or like you know, something other than radiation. <laughs> well, we do a genetically modified spider, right? So, yeah. so Jorge, well, well could we, so, so sorry, could, could we create a spider person? Or well, let's make it easier, we'll start, right? Because in the lab, we would start with a 
spider hamster or a spider pig. Spider hamster. I mean, we can. Spider pig. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, we can we can create like a spider with powers. No, that doesn't mean that if that spider bites a man or a woman, that person is going to get the pro the powers that that spider can get, right? But yeah, we can definitely probably um, get into the spiders and get into. I mean, one thing that is going to happen, no, if you get bite by a spider, in order to for your DNA to get changed in a way that it would actually make it some kind of develop extra powers or extra abilities in your persona. If you're already an adult, that's most likely not going to happen because, I mean, if you get bitten in your hand or something like that, it's not going to change your whole body. No? It's only going to change in that specific particular place. Hmm. But that probably is going to raise a lot of ethical concerns in all of you. If you go to the embryo or if you go to the babies and you start manipulating these guys, then it's probably easier to make all these changes to develop in the whole body. No? Obviously, we're not doing that in humans. As far as we know, I don't know in other countries, uh, but we can do it in animals, no, and especially on the spiders. And then you can get into the spiders, you can get into the eggs, you can manipulate what they do, you can mix genes between different species, and then you can actually get some kind of chimera kind of thing. Okay, there are actually some spiders that they can jump way more than they're supposed to be. I don't want to get anywhere near these guys. Why is someone making that? That's horrible. I don't know. I mean, I guess they are just trying to figure out. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we should probably ask this, this scientist. I mean, but yeah, so we can definitely do some things with animals. I mean, doing it with humans is a little bit more complicated for a lot of different reasons, no? But, but yeah, so watch out depending on which kind of labs are you, are you visiting on. <laughs> well, we, 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 so it takes a, a different notice that watch out, here comes the Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. Yes, just uh, um, I think uh, you guys are very familiar with the CRISPR-Cas9 mm -hmm. technology. And that's basically, that's, uh, basically a te uh, technology technique that allows you to modify RNA. Uh, and back in 2011, we modified a cat with, uh, with the, what we call the uh, GFP. GFP, glowing uh, protein, uh, fluorescent protein. And then it was put it into a cat. So now you'll see a cat that uh, glows in the dark. <laughs> Up there, that means I escaped from that lab. <laughs> so uh, just, just bring it back, okay? <laughs> don't let it scratch it because we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> like, you know, uh, <laughs> so uh, it's possible to modify right now animals. And then as, as uh, my colleague pointed out, Chernobyl, we found different animals mm -hmm. growing up to more than four legs. And, uh, and even uh, frogs that actually their skin is totally uh, clear. You can actually see the organs and the skeleton and how it functions. Just imagine that. And that was just through that radiation. But again, we don't want to do that. <laughs> Whenever people ask if science can create Spider-Man, I'm always like, why, why, why does science want to kill people's uncle? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so everybody's familiar with Peter Porker, right? The spectacular Spider-Ham. Right, everybody knows that character? Yeah. But he, uh, he's actually a, he's not a pig that was mutated into a spider. He's a spider that was mutated into a pig, uh, canonically. Uh, that seems reasonable then, right? Based on what you're saying, we could do that? You could make Peter Porker? <laughs> I mean, we can get it, we can... <laughs> Anyone in here? You heard yeah. it here first. I mean, I think that it's going to be a lot of trial and error. We can try to make a Peter Parker. We are probably not going to get it right on the first time. <laughs> so, I don't know. Maybe if you are volunteer to maybe grow some extra arms, maybe grow some extra hair in your, in your, I mean, not necessarily be able to walk through the walls and stuff, maybe. But yeah, I mean, I don't think that's going to happen in the near future. As, as we were mentioning early in the, in the panel, I think it's way more probable that if we're going to get ever something close to a Spider-Man, is going to be more akin to a technology gadget like Iron Man kind of suit than to be actually be able to shoot spider webs through your wrist. Yeah. That would be cool. I'm not going to lie. But. <laughs> so, um, well, and John, you kind of brought up this question, right? Because you, you all like to create lab access. Right? <laughs> now, is that, is that just some deep-seated dislike of scientists? Or is it just basically a good convenience for the plot? Or, or again, so what... Why all the lab access? You know, I mean, if you go back on like, the history of comics, uh, the Golden Age stuff, it was almost all magical or sort of hand wavy. You know, how Superman strong? Oh, he's from another planet. Like it wasn't really a big deal until you got to like post World War II that like Superman became more science fictiony, and everything kind of became more science fictiony around that point. So you had uh, 
Uh, the one I always think about is this funny, is a uh, Hawkman found an artifact in ancient Egypt and got, got powers, and Green Lantern found an artifact in ancient Egypt and got powers, and they rebooted them in the uh, 50s. They were space cops. The end. Um, so yeah, live accident, I mean, I think that really kind of started with like the Flash, uh, which was also the start of like the multiverse in comics, is uh, the Flash could vibrate between dimensions, and that's where you, you met the Golden Age Flash in another reality. So yeah, I mean, it was, it was really the Jet Age, the Atomic Age. Uh, um, uh, there's a great book that, uh, that Darwin Cook did um, at DC that we all know, The New Frontier. Uh, sorry, I forgot the name. Uh, that's really all about that, that, that era. And it's, it's always easy to accidentally or intentionally make science the bad guy in the stories. Um, and it's interesting that I think a lot of the stuff that when, in these early superhero origins, everybody was very pro pro stuff we wouldn't necessarily be super into now, you know, whether it's Fantastic Four trying to beat the commies to the moon or uh, Spider-Man getting bit by a radioactive spider. Like, we know, like, oh, that's really not a good idea, <laughs> but radiation, even in the 60s, to the lay person writing a comic book was pretty mysterious and pretty, you know, pretty weird. So, um, yeah, I think that's, you know, it was, it was the, the fascination with science and I think that fuels a lot of stuff, you know. Now, nowadays, you definitely would be, it would be genetic engineering. It, it, it's you know that kind of stuff that goes into the stories, um, and, you know, multiverse stuff. I like to add um, what I love about the accessibility of science or science fiction within comics is that sometimes it's the first exposure for so many people to these scientific topics. It makes it engaging and mysterious, and you want to find out more. And it really encourages more young scientists, in particular, to join this community. I know. So many people who got involved and started studying science become professional scientists because this is where they originally inspired. So I, I applaud having that integrated into the story, even if we can argue the finer details of it all, because I think it really brings in a new audience, a new perspective, and it constantly makes us ask questions about what is possible, what could we do. I, oh yeah, that's a great answer. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I think it's, I, I find it interesting that um, I, I feel like the fact that so many things happen because of lab accidents is part of our like anxiety about um, science and like what it can do that most of the origins aren't like oh we're conducting an experiment here's what we think is going to happen now I'm going to inject myself and then ex exactly what I thought happened happened and now I'm a monster mm -hmm. that it's, it's it's never like the you know the like positive part of the scientific method it's always like oh this went wrong um, but then I also think it's interesting because that actually is a more accurate reflection of the process of doing science that things always happen that you're like oh I didn't think that this is how it was gonna go and then you have to explain that weird result or that mm. thing that didn't work um, so it's almost like it's a it's almost the same way that science actually operates but without all of the disastrous mega villain <laughs> implications <laughs> <laughs> yeah, normally, if there is a lab accident, the, the thing that happens is that you get probably a big reprimand from your supervisor, or you need to call a HNS to clean all the mess. Normally, not doesn't get superheroes. I mean, the, but there are some examples also, like in real world, of lab accidents that they really came to very good discoveries. I guess that most people know here penicillin, how it was discovered. No, that was kind of a lab accident. No, he just left the the culture plate. On the, on the bench and then it started growing. It didn't expect what was gonna happen, so we discovered penicillin, no? And so made a lot of good things for humanity after that. But that's kind of the, more like the exception than the norm, no? Mm -hmm. we know normally, the process of science is very trial and error, a lot of perseverance, a lot of patience, and then finally, you get to discover something cool, no? So, uh, yeah. Well, it's just like my supervisor told me, Vic, you can make mistakes, just not twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so, uh, how many uh, experiments have you run on yourselves? Oh, no. <laughs> well, we're allowed to talk about. <laughs> I, who was it that w inventing like a very early vaccine who tried it out on? Oh. Yeah, Salk. Oh, the polio. Yeah. The polio vaccine. He injected it in uh, his own son in order to prove that it worked. Yeah, there was yeah. even the guy that um, who discovered stomach ulcers. He like drank whatever the thing was himself to give him the ulcers, and then drank the antibiotic to prove that it worked. And you know, yep. wouldn't recommend doing that. <laughs> not encouraged. Not encouraged. Got the Nobel Prize a few decades back. So. What powers did he get? <laughs> <laughs> I think just a really upset stomach. <laughs> I'm a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
Well, certainly one of the big pieces in, the, in uh, well, certainly in the last uh, couple of years is this idea of multiple universes, which again, I have to imagine for storytelling is just a huge, huge opportunity uh, in terms of what you can do. And, and certainly if you're a, a, a movie studio who needs to take the property and redo it <laughs> again, it makes it really, really convenient. So thanks science once again. Another thing brought to you by science is reboots. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a good question, right? It's something that's been talked about right now. So, the multiverse. How real? Is it not real? So what is it? The, uh, the concepts of multiverse verses have been around for a long time, actually, since basically quantum mechanics uh, first um, was developed. And quantum mechanics has this probabilistic view of uh, interactions and, like, all atoms. And so there's some probability of, you know, the ca it, in Schrodinger's cat, for example, there's... Um, a cat in a box with a, um, let's say it's a radioactive isotope that has a 50% chance of decaying in a certain amount of time and it kills the cat. And so if you seal the box and you don't know what's up with it, you wait a certain amount of time, there's a 50% chance that the cat is dead and the 50% chance that the cat is alive. And in this, um, so this is Schrodinger's cat. And, um, you know, once you open the box, then you collapse the waveform and you, have, you force it to choose which way it is. Is it dead or is it alive? But while the box is closed and you can't observe it, the cat is in both states simultaneously. And this, like, um, superposition is what it's called. People don't like it. It's very uncomfortable. Einstein said about quantum mechanics that God doesn't like to play dice. And a way around this is to say there is one universe in which the cat is alive and another universe in which the cat is dead. And so you can, like, split your probability into two universes. And this is called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And a lot of people disagree with it um, because basically every single atom in your body at all times and in like the entire world and the entire universe is going through these changes in quantum states. And so there's would be infinite numbers of universes like popping off all the time, which makes a lot of universes. Um, but there is a different way of having, there's actually other ways of having multiverses that still obey the laws of physics. So our universe is really giant, as we discovered last week with pictures from JWST. The deep field image was, uh, is the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length, and it's full of like thousands of galaxies. And that's in every single direction. Our visible universe is really huge, but we think that there's more universe outside of our horizon, that light takes a certain amount of time to travel. And you can imagine if you go far enough away, there's gonna be another kind of like horizon bubble that we will never interact with because the spaces between are just so vast. And you could call that its own universe. Um, and then if you keep going, there's another one of those. And if you keep going, there's another one all out in every direction so that even in our universe right now, there's like these multiverses that we're never gonna experience. And if space is infinite, which we think that it is, then there should be another universe that is exactly like this universe if you just like go far enough, that like we will have an exact copy of our universe. Hmm. And Max Tegmark, who is a, a famous physicist, has thought a lot about multiverses. He calculated that the, uh, the approximate distance of that other exact copy universe is gonna be 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 29 meters away from us, which I tried to figure out what that is in light years, and it's just like too big of a number. Um, so there's, that's like actually a very well accepted theory of a, a possible, if the universe is truly infinite, then there's gonna be exact copies or copies of our universe that are off by just like a tiny bit. The problem is that we can never get there because they're so far away. Yeah. Hmm. And when a lot of people think about multiverses, and I'm sorry that this answer is so long, I'm just really into it. <laughs> <laughs> when people think about multiverses, they think about being able to travel. And so in, in the realm of string theory, there's these concepts of membranes, which are these higher dimensional spaces. And so our universe exists within these membranes. And they're partly uh, postulated as a way to explain why gravity is so weak and like gravity doesn't really jive with the other forces in our universe. Um, and so if there's, if there's some higher dimensional space, that then all we have to do is like get there, or like punch through it somehow. And then you would have access to all these other universes, some of which are probably like our universe and some of which are probably just like rock universes or something. So physicists basically sit in a room and think about the exact same things that happen in comic books and see if we can make them possible or <laughs> it not. It's very inspiring. It's kind, of, it's kind of what happens every day. You have a, a whiteboard and you, you postulate these ideas and you're like, all right, if this were true and this assumption were right, then how can we actually make this happen? 
There's other kinds of, of multiverse possibilities, but I feel like I've like made this answer long enough. <laughs> there's, there's so many multiverse possibilities, then that sounds like you have like infinite possibilities about so many different universes, no? Maybe we have another universe in which the Earth is populated by reptilians instead yeah. of humans. Yeah, if you go far enough in our universe, you find that. The other thing Th I think That's is YouTube you're thinking of. Yeah, you looked it up on YouTube, I believe. <laughs> or parts of this universe. Um, the other thing I think is funny that is that I've, I've been thinking about it and I think that there either is only one universe, like our universe, or there have to be an infinite number of universes. I can't imagine a, a like... Finite number? Uh, yeah, I can't yeah, imagine a situation where there's like 12. Yeah. Yeah, why 12? <laughs> well, there's also... Uh, in this multiverse, we have what we call the parallel universe. And then the multiverse is because we have too many universes clumped together like cells. And also we have what we call the bubble universe also. Uh, and then comes the third one, which is the quantum mechanics. Uh, so it's very interesting. And I guess that you guys have seen Outlander portals, have mm. seen the metrics, uh, having a metrics made around us and there's a deja vu and this story's already done, what's happening? Those are the little portals that transport you to a different universes and different uh, stages in some other uh, universes as well. So with, the, uh, so with these universes are far away or close together, but it's again being able to get to a, to get to a higher dimension, to be able to get there. Um, let's go a little more terrestrial and uh, we'll go back to Spider-Man himself. And, uh, so would webs be a really good way to get around? I mean, it looks really cool, and who wouldn't want to do that? But I've been to New York. Uh, well, I think you could all use it like around Manhattan. You need maybe like downtown San Diego. You need some tall buildings, and like absolutely no fear of heights. Definitely, you need those buildings in order to uh, to swing around. And you say, "Oh, there's crime happening in Barrio Logan." Oh, there's no building. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess on that note, I mean, maybe it would really only work in downtown San Diego. Because have, have we ever seen these webs work when it's like pouring rain or snowing or like there's a thunderstorm or a hurricane? Like, is like, would they just not fall off? Yeah, I think the material itself is is the questionable part. I would say if 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 it acted as if it were in the comic books or movies, and you didn't ask what it was made out of. I would argue, yes, it's an excellent way to get around. It's, it's infinitely more uh, efficient than probably what we're driving around in our commute every day. I think the question is really, what is the web made out of? Because its properties are so dynamic and different depending on the situation in mm. any scene of a comic or movie that you can't really nail down what it is. I was trying to figure this out while watching some of the movies and seeing it in live action. And sometimes it has like this spring-like material, sometimes it's incredibly stiff, sometimes there's a force, sometimes it's soft, Sometimes it's tacky, sometimes it's like pliable. It's really hard to nail down the material properties. And again, this is just from movie observation. I did not get this in a lab. This is not, this is not a scientific way to, to really research material. But once you actually get that material, if that were possible, I would easily give up my car. <laughs> I think this actually, I mean, I think that Tom Holland actually has different substances for depending what he wants to do, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly in the movies. Okay. But that's totally a question in the Tobey Maguire case, yeah. because he's just spitting from the same hole all the time. He's doing so many different <laughs> things. So it's like, damn, that really has a lot of properties. Yeah, you can't mix up taser web. We, <laughs> that's, that's another thing. I mean, there's a, I think that the scene where he kind of, I, I don't know which movie is the second or the third, that he just stops the metro, that he, I mean, the, the trolley that yeah. he's about to crash. So he just gets the, he slings the web all over the tunnel. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of spider web. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's a limit of how many things you can get inside your body. So how, how is he able to get all that many stuff out of his body and he's still, you know? Yeah, because the mass couldn't change, right? Like, I mean, he would, like, he's losing a lot of mass when he shoots that out. He'd have to be consuming that much to be able to fill it back up, right? Yeah, exactly. Like just... I would like to know what he eats. <laughs> let's, uh, let's turn the tables a little bit here and, and uh, talk about the villains you can't have a superhero without supervillains. Mm. And certainly there are a whole range of them there that, that touch on a lot of the things we talked about before, right? technology and live accident changes again <laughs> <clears throat> on the other side of it. So I'll just throw it to you guys. Uh, what's, uh, what's your favorite uh, villain and, uh, and why? I have a least favorite villain, yeah. Oh, yeah. if that's okay. Yeah. So these are some hot takes, guys. <laughs> um, I have particular issues with Sandman. 
Um, <laughs> so his like creation is that he goes into a particle physics lab, gets caught up in some spinny thing, and you know becomes sand afterwards, but then can morph into an amorphous body of life. And I, you can see him like accumulate mass at any given point. Like he can just pick up more sand out of nowhere. Um, so I always question, what is the essence of Sandman? What piece of sand is Sandman? If he can disintegrate into sand and then become sand, like, where is this man really? Uh, I have strong issues with that one. Also, in the movie, how the lab itself was warned, it wasn't a, a sign that said, warning, caution, do not cross this fence. It was warning, high particle physics lab. I'm like, what normal human sees that and knows what kind of danger that could possibly be? <laughs> I'm like, that is that is bad lab safety yeah. right there. <laughs> That's like well, the every Vilgen's origin story is like bad lab safety. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, my favorite is Venom, also because mm. it's a symbiotic mm. uh, entity from outer space. It's not from Earth, and. Uh, and also because it's just amazing. I don't like that part of the sound. Like, he can do, you know, he's able to do anything. But sound, kill, like, makes it crazy. Uh, I mean, well. it's quiet in space. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's what I like, Ben. That's what it is. The one, the one that I like particularly is Green Goblin. Mm. I'm not allowed to speak bad of my CEO, Norman Oscorp, <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. No, but I think I actually like it for one particular reason is that I think that most people, I mean, not only more villains, no, as we we're talking, they have some kind of like this original story or they are like aliens or that. The Green Goblin is actually something that could, could actually exist. I mean, maybe the technology is still not there to get like the flying gadget and all that, but he's just a crazy person. He's just a crazy person. <laughs> he's just a crazy person that has like bipolar or schizophrenia or both. I mean, that's things that, that exist, and there's people that suffer daily because of that, no? So that's something that maybe science can actually help on tackling these kind of issues, no? So I like that there are, I, I actually like the villains that you can kind of relate a little bit more, mm -hmm. that you can actually find them in your everyday life, you know? So that's I, what I like about him. I really like the Green Goblin also, because, and I think that Willem Dafoe's portrayal of oh. him, ha, it, yeah. like, makes him so relatable, and there's, like, so much pathos in it that I feel like you really, especially in the most recent Spider-Man movie that you, like, really, I mean, maybe it's a trick also, but then, like, you feel for him. Yeah, yeah I'm a, like, I, I like Doc Ock because he does the thing we talked about with those lab accident origins where he reverses what Spider-Man does. I mean, he's the other eight-legged creature, but he has, a, <laughs> he has a lab accident, but he turns bad, and it's the, it's the evil version. And we, in the, if anybody read the uh, Superior Spider-Man, if anybody remembers that, like, that's what really kind of makes that work. He is the inverse of Peter Parker. Uh, um, everything Peter wants to be in the beginning, but then wrecks it. Does that mean that like his nephew has to die? <laughs> <laughs> well, he married Aunt May yeah. briefly, so that would have been no, that wouldn't. Have, well, yeah, it would have been Peter. It would have been a step nephew. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh no. <laughs> so John, tell us when you write a new chapter, hmm. Transformers, or any other comics that you run on. What do you think when you think of a villain? How do you like the villain? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the best thing, I mean, to me, the best thing is where it's like the, the negation of the hero. It's the, 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 you know, the, the more that can be the thing that is the antithesis of what the hero wants, you know, the better it is. I think that's why I, like, I'm attracted to like a Doc Ock or something. You can, you, can, you can draw those parallels to other people. I mean, Green Goblin is probably his biggest arch nemesis, really, because of, you know. Of, the whole history. Right, the whole history and everything, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, you know, to me, it's finding what, what is it, what, you know, what does the hero stand for, and what can you do that not only is the like, well, not only is the inverse of that, but is that turned into the worst thing it could be, and and that's you know the biggest thing the hero can have to overcome. I will say what I had um, I pointed out while while watching all the villains is that there's this idea it's it's a pure scientist usually that is so interested in their work and they don't have any conce like concept of the outside world or any more like character development besides this passion for science and that, that pursuit drives them to this, this madness and a sense of evil and part of it. And I would say that then, this is a terrible portrayal of scientists, guys. <laughs> this, is yeah. not, this is not who we are. <laughs> I would say you can find some fanatical people in any of these places who will 
absolutely talk your ear off about what they do and what they research, who are so excited. But I have never met anyone who's gone to the point where they kind of forget how human they are. <laughs> yeah. And I would hope to never meet those people. Well, yeah, I would say, like, that's actually really important. Yeah, that is another thing about villains, is you also want to like remember what your metaphor is and not accidentally make something you know, like, like, not make this all your villains be those be that scientist because right. you're 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 that's exactly yeah you're being this. You don't want to create this anti-science, you know, uh, uh, comic. You really need to think through what does it mean, what I, what I'm saying on that. And yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point. There are, that is a cheap way to go about making villains is just oh, obsessed scientist. You know, okay, yeah. we've seen that a lot, and I think, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think it's better to do something a little more interesting and give somebody. Give somebody that a metaphor or like it's an origin that isn't uh, uh, something you're actually opposed to morally when you're writing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. maybe that's why I'm getting glazed over eyes when I start talking about my work. They're like worried about me if I'm getting too do? involved. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to become the super villain myself. <laughs> so uh, we've got time now. I'm going like, to save some time here for questions from you all. We've got a mic in the center there. So if you've got a question on Spider Man, Spider versus spider pigs. <laughs> um, for our group here, please make your way on up. Uh, and as people think about things to be thinking about. Um, so with, uh, with all of this and, and thinking about all the, the things you seem to be, uh, let's, just take the, let's just take the movies. Um, what's the one thing that you thought, oh, that's really good because that's just like, that's right on science. And which is like, oh, right. And I'll just say my own personal one is, it's actually back to again this train, right? This ever accelerating train, this ever or decelerating train, right? The train drops, the, jumps the tracks and slides at a constant speed for ten frickin' minutes. It just drives me nuts. I get it. It's exciting. No, it's not. It just. Ugh. But are there particular things that you thought, oh, that's really right on because it just feels so right? And then these are the ones like, I. You pushed it till it broke. I, uh, I hate the Staten Island Ferry. It's, it's the Staten Island Ferry, right? Mm -hmm. Where that it's like getting cut in half and he's like holding it together and I'm just like, <laughs> it's water, man. It's gonna get, it, it's over. It's already over, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really like in Tom Holland's character how excited he is about science. I think I find that a lot in my peers. Um, I think it was when he was interacting with like Doctor Strange and he goes into the mirror dimension and he's like, oh my gosh, it's geometry. And he has like this moment where he's just so excited <laughs> yeah. about like geometry. I'm like, oh yeah, no, I feel that. That is all of my peer group. I'm like, this is, this is very much a science thing. I feel so much anxiety for, his, for Tom Holland's Spider-Man because I feel like he's just like a little baby and he shouldn't be in those situations. <laughs> it makes me like so much more anxious for him than any of the other Spider-Man. Yeah. Maybe yeah. because he is so earnest and excited. Yeah, and it's also, I think what's kind of sad is that the idea that Spider-Man is acting alone, and, and I mean in his own universe, right? Uh, he's your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, but he doesn't have like quite the same team you would as a normal scientist would in any mm -hmm. lab. I always collaborate with all the people in my work, in my field, um, my peers, um, my leadership, people, my techs, everything. And, and I think there's a sense of camaraderie and teamwork rather than an individual singular scientist that's a, a genius good or evil, yeah. um, that has that mentality. And it, it, I, would, I would love if, if Spider-Man could have more science friends. But you know, it's probably a niche, niche crowd. <laughs> I, th I think that's actually very important. I yeah. mean, because I think that the, the, the image no, or the stereotype of the lone scientist, mad scientist, that he has his own lab and he does these kind of things and then he gets crazy and stuff. Yeah. That, I mean, science they cannot be further from the truth. I mean, every, every science lab that you can ask, they work in teams. Nobody works alone. You are always interacting with your peers. I mean, as, as Chelsea just said, I mean, so the, the image from the lone scientist doing stuff, it's it's not true at all. Another thing that is not true is that experiments normally finished in like two minutes. Yeah. That's also not true at all. Normally when you're doing any kind of experiment, it's like, no, you're not gonna get the result in like five minutes or 10 minutes or, or even a day. Yeah. Normally it takes weeks or sometimes months. So yeah. it's kind of a slow process. That's another caveat that, well, it's just how it is. And even just to add on to that, any experiment that you get the results and they're correct the first time, and you can make all these things and you make all these treatments or you figure this out, Half the time I run an experiment and the results come back inconclusive, got to run it again. Like that's probably I think a more realistic view of science than what we often tend to see with like the last minute dramatic like solving of the problem. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't happen in real life. Every time you see something out there, 
what they call OTC of the shelf, uh, of the counter, of the, of the counter. Uh, that's something that it took at least 10 years to be created. <laughs> it took uh, clinical trials, they call even pre this R&D research and development, and then it went on to actually preclinical and then clinical trials. Uh, preclinical is technically animals, and then clinicals are human, and then out to the market. So it takes anything that you see up there more than 10 years, especially any medicine. <laughs> Hello, my name is Miles. I'm not a scientist, but I am an engineer. And the question I have for the panel is more, how do you balance uh, between science either discovering or inventing something really cool versus what could be dangerous or hurtful to society? Oh, okay. <laughs> Go for it. That's a fun one. Um, <laughs> so I've, I, I joked with the panel, as we met earlier this week, I've been working in defense for the past seven years or so, so I joke like Oscorp, I know, I know. <laughs> um, I really have to believe in what the science is, what my leadership is saying, and ultimately know what's going to happen with the products I'm developing. Right? I, I do very much find you have to have a purpose in what you're building and what you're building it for. You can make science cool and science for science sake, but uh, with the missions that I have, I, I really want to make sure I know what it's being used for and that I believe in what it is. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Hi. So in the spirit of um, representation of women in STEM, I would like to know if, if, you, um, if you could imagine in, uh, in the future spider world, if there is a, uh, maybe some poor laboratory signage uh, that would result in a very interesting uh, female um, you know, Dr. Frankenstein type uh, villain and superpowers, or even a uh, hero that Spider-Man can work with. Um, what would, what could you see happening there? I feel like a, a female supervillain is almost set up to be an anti-hero, right? Uh, you wouldn't want to stick to any stereotypes or tropes because you really want to develop the, the full character of what a, a female scientist is. Um, so I think a complex backstory um, to explain some outward behavior. So it's, it's a, a maybe a, a rebellious person, right? I could see that very easily but with, a, with a past that you can identify with. So I would say definitely an anti-hero type. Just to add up, female scientists, they rock the world. <laughs> they, 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 take, they take over us. There's a, I, would, I don't know if you heard it, but I think it's a, in my field, it's 10 to 1. So, good job, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. I just wanted to get your view on time travel. Do you see it as being linear or interdimensional? So the question is, um, the view on time travel as being linear or interdimensional. Linear or going between dimensions. It's between dimensions. So I think um, uh, time travel is tricky. It's not specifically restricted by general relativity. So like potentially it's possible. It is sort of restricted by the laws of thermodynamics um, that like entropy, ha like we don't actually really have a good explanation for why time moves yeah. forward in, in, in our universe. Um, and um, so I think, I mean, I would feel, um, I would feel like more comfortable with some sort of interdimensional version of time travel because then you kind of like get around all of that stuff that's like, well, you're in a higher space and you can like move in different ways and then you end up back in this universe at some previous time. That feels like it'd be easier to, to kind of justify. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, I, would, I, I feel like it's easier to say you can move around the three-dimensional time space rather than travel up and down a linear timeline. Yeah. It feels right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Thank you all for doing this panel. It's been uh, very fascinating. Oh, can you speak up closer to the microphone? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Thanks. Okay. For those of you who've done consulting work, or I guess in a hypothetical scenario with um, consulting with writers, how do you balance that dynamic of their ideas with what is actually um, able to happen in the real world? Well, it depends what kind of consulting work, no, and for whom. No, normally, as a scientist, we normally get uh, offer consultants for other firms or other companies that are not scientists to have a scientist perspective. 
and most of the times you kind of need to shut down the expectations of things that they want to do because normally a lot of people get very excited about things that maybe are possible or maybe are not and then when you are actually in the field and you know how things work you need to kind of lessen the expectations like okay maybe we can do this but it's not going to be easy or it's going to take a lot of time no so normally that's how we are normally set it's, it's a little bit like like this panel, no? I mean, so we are talking about the science of superheroes, and at the end we are kind of saying that, okay, it's not possible to make a superhero out of scratch, which may be disappointing, but in the other way, we can do a lot of cool things in science. We are doing a lot of cool stuff. I mean, the news about the new telescope. I mean, we cannot get a new superhero by doing genetic manipulation, but we can start to cure some diseases. We can cure uh, sickle cell disease now, well, or they are starting to get there. So there is a lot of cool things that science can do. Uh, so I don't want anyone to get discouraged just by the fact that we cannot make real life superheroes. I think we can do another cool stuff. So hopefully, after this panel, you guys get excited and want to know a little bit more about the cool things that we can do. I actually have a real world uh, example of, of, of writing a, a comic book and, and consulting scientists. Uh, I used to uh, edit a comic called The Ultimates, and uh, um, it was a, like basically The Avengers. And in one of the issues, uh, Captain America gets taken down by, by this, uh, like a, he gets drugged and he gets taken down. And Mark Miller, who wrote it, just like left a blank when they talked about what chemical they used. So I called my wife, who's a scientist. And I was like, hey, in real life, what would you do to take down Captain America? And this is before all the movies came out, so I kind of had to explain how Captain America works. And they were like, okay, tetrodotoxin D. Okay, so we put that in the comic. When they went to make Captain America Winter Soldier, that's actually what they used to take down Nick Fury. Uh, and it's not like tetrodotoxin D isn't a real thing that anybody could have figured out, but I do like to think that my wife is the reason that that wound up in, in, uh, in Winter Soldier. <laughs> Thank you. All right, can you hear me? Yep. You can? Okay, very good. Um, so I read in a book by uh, Mark Brake and John Chase, they're science communicators um, in the science of Star Wars. Uh, I read that there are 20 other bases, like acidic bases, uh, that can be used in genetics, not for like DNA, but uh, for other things that didn't arise. Uh, through evolution and stuff. DNA just kind of happened to be the thing that sprouted up, whereas there's other elements like silicone and stuff that could also maybe produce the same kind of bonds that carbon can. All right, maybe I'm going off on a few things <laughs> here. But if the, the spider is radioactive, okay, so... Um, Using radiation, you can kind of loosen the bonds in the DNA. If that, if I'm asking if that's kind of possible, and if so, could they take out um, like a bond of the DNA uh, acid bases and replace them with those 20 other known mm. bases or something like that? And would that produce a result like a spider person? <laughs> Uh, did that make yeah. sense? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm hoping uh, for a one-word answer. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in my introduction, I was called a dark immunologist. So, the human genome is six billion long. Right. Uh, everything that we know about diseases and infections, anything that you can think about going bad with the human genome, is only the 2%. That's all we know, and that's all that we are actually been working on. 98% of the human genome is called the dark matter. <laughs> we don't know what is in there. They finally, I believe a couple years ago, I think they unraveled it and read it, but they don't know what the heck is it. So that's what we're working on, on working that 98%. Uh, and now we're finding different uh, parts of the DNA that actually is affecting the neurons on our brain, especially for Alzheimer. So that's the new things that's gonna come. But as we start reading these frames, these DNA frames, and we can un actually understand, it's kind of like, think about like if you go to Egypt and you see all these panels, the information is there. Just now you need to actually translate it to understand and read, oh, look, here it says, if you remove 
now with Casper Cas9 technology, you can actually remove uh, certain parts of the RNA and then put new ones and then put it into inside the nucleus so it will express that protein in order to get what you want. So it is possible, but we're not there yet. So I guess, Victor, what you might be saying is that at the end of the day, you might not even need a radioactive spider to unlock a lot of powers. You might have some powers inside you in true superhero fashion that <laughs> might get unleashed at some point. Yes, actually. Um, so, yeah, so I think yes, if that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, obviously what it says is there's a lot more to science to learn about who we are ourselves, a lot of places to go, and we'd have a lot more to talk about as well. But it is time for the next panel to go in. So I want to thank you all for coming, and please... Help me thank our panelists. Yes. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Have a great, great rest of your con. Come up and see us in Melbourne. Okay. You guys have been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.